Hi everybody, my name is Anne. Thanks for joining me on Art on the Creek. We are here in my home studio in Parker, Colorado, and I am very happy that you've tuned in. Welcome! We are completing the second series of 15 watercolor lessons for beginners. Now, if you aren't a beginner, feel free to paint along anyway. I hope it's a subject matter that you'll like, and maybe you'll learn something new about yourself in the process. Our art wall is really growing back here, and a lot of that is because of these beginner lessons. I will put a playlist in the description underneath the video, and you'll be able to watch them in any order. You can do whichever one you like, whichever one tickles your fancy. And again, they're beginner lessons, but you don't have to be a beginner to do them. So let's all go have some fun. Since it is fall, let's paint a nice arrangement of gourds. Are you ready? Here we go. Our reference photo for today is this one here. I've chosen it from Unsplash, which is a free reference photo site. And I will link to it in the description so you can use that as any, any way that you want to. And the supplies that we'll be using today are the Princeton Snap brushes. I really like those for beginner artists. And I also really like this paper. It's a Paul Rubens 5x7 block, uh, which means the pages are adhered all but a little space on the top. Um, all the way around. And then we've got our Paul Rubens paints. Now in the last section of 15 watercolor lessons, I recommended Winsor Newton Cotman paints, which I still love and I will still recommend. I just want you to find products that are not going to break the bank and that you will enjoy using. And that's why I really wanted to call attention to this Paul Rubens set because it is a set of 24 colors. It's a beautiful array. The colors are beautifully pigmented and they do have light fast ratings. So this should be a pretty good set for you. Um, don't feel as though you have to buy something though. You can certainly use whatever you have on hand. For the paper though, I definitely recommend that you're using a cotton watercolor paper. If you have a wood pulp paper and that's what you've got, um, you know, go ahead and use it up. It is, it is good paper. It's not that it's bad. It's just that when you're learning watercolor, I think that the the things that you get in return from a cotton a paper when you put uh, put water on it, when you, when you get it wet, are more important for you to learn. Uh, because when you're using a wood pulp paper and then you switch over to cotton, then um, you know a lot of times you have, have to unlearn some things. So go ahead, get yourself some good cotton watercolor paper, and this Paul Rubens is pretty affordable. So what I like to do here is start with those circles. Now those are just guidelines. What I'm going to do, I'm just using a regular click pencil from the school supply aisle. I'm really looking at how the shapes of these gourds are. They're, they're very indented in their, in their clefts there. there. There's really quite a bit. I'm not counting how many clefts there are. I'm not trying to match the drawing exactly. I'm just filling in the, the circle guide that I've got with what looks to be about the right size of a wedge for that particular lobe or cleft. And I'm going to do that all around all of these pumpkins. Um, I'm going to use the words pumpkins and gourds and squash interchangeably throughout this video because I don't know the names of all these pumpkins and um, I just think they're pretty. I've been to really some really interesting pumpkin farms that have all different kinds. I think the white one might be called a ghost pumpkin. And then of course there's turban squash, which I really love. That has some really cool colors on it. That one's not here. Um, in this particular photo, but I really like it. <laughs> and then there is a Cinderella pumpkin, which is just, of course, the best name for a pumpkin ever. And it's the one that's kind of uh, squashed flat, like a pin cushion. And it's a beautiful rosy pink orange color. I really like that one a lot. But of course, the, the one that we always get is for a jack-o'-lantern for our front porch and uh, for the trick-or-treaters. And uh, since we have so many deer, I cannot put that outside until Halloween day. I, if there is a pumpkin on our porch, the deer will eat the entire thing before Halloween comes. So 
our Halloween decorations on our house are really pretty, uh, pretty minimal. And it's kind of funny because the neighborhood really went all out today. And I feel like I'm kind of poo-pooing the holiday and I'm not. I really love Halloween, but we'll, we will have our pumpkin out and we will be able to give candy to all, to everyone who comes you know, to our door and uh, we'll, we'll have a real good time with it. We just won't have too, too many decorations <laughs> because the deer will, uh, will eat everything out there that we have that is uh, a pumpkin. Uh, that doesn't happen necessarily to our neighbor's house, but they really like our house. So that's the way that is. And uh, we'll have to see um, this year we've got a dog. You know, we have Leo. And oh my gosh, you guys, we got him a Halloween costume. I'll be sure and post that because he is going to be so cute. He's going to be a little dinosaur. So <laughs> all of these things that we're doing for him, we have a car seat for him and he wears sweaters and vests. These are all things I swore I would never do with my dog, but uh, he's tiny and uh, you kind of feel like you want to protect him a little bit. And he needs a little bit of warmth sometimes because he's definitely not as warm as our Sheba was. Her fur was incredibly thick and uh, Leo's just got um, a little bit of a uh, little bit of curls going. So his, his fur is not quite as thick. So we'll keep him warm this winter. Going back to our gourds here, I'm kind of changing the shape of my circles a little bit just to make everything fit. Um, once you get the lobes going and uh, you figure out where you want your centers of your pumpkin, you know, you might have to change your original map lines a little bit and that's okay. Uh, that's why we wanted to make those circles a little bit lightly uh, in the beginning, just enough so that you can see them. And then we'll go in and fill in the rest here. And since everything we're looking right on top of, of all of these pumpkins, it's an overhead view. Most of the stems are going to be uh, slightly tipped uh, or um, straight on. But that one in the bottom left, when you look at it, it's really almost laying down on the pumpkin. So be sure that you um, try and draw those stems as accurately as you can, because that's something that will give your pumpkin a lot of life. Now, what I want to cover with this particular lesson is there are so many patterns and shapes in those pumpkins, particularly the ones that are multicolor. I'm going to show you an easy way to do it so that you will convey that texture, but you won't have to actually draw all of that. Now, I'm not going to erase my lines because I want you guys to see them, but before you paint, this would be the time where you would wanna take your kneaded eraser and roll it over your paper a little bit just to lighten those lines. Of course, if you don't mind the lines showing, like I don't, then um, you know that is part of the, the birth of your watercolor, so you can certainly uh, leave them in there. So let's start painting. I've got the number four round and I'm going down those cleft lines starting in the upper left and that's just because I'm right-handed. And the yellow that I'm using here, let me put my glasses on so that I can see what I've committed to. The yellow that I'm using is the cadmium yellow medium. And I'm just going down the clefts of that and now I've gone in with just water and I'm filling in the lobe portion. So you can see I'm going down either side and then down the middle. So with that wet brush, when I go down the sides where I've put that first swath of paint, I'm going to pick up a little bit of color. And then I'm just going to swipe that down the middle. So what this is doing is it's softening those edges of uh, the, the paint that we put on first in the clefts for the lobes. And then that faint line that will come up the middle. So that's just kind of our first step here. We're going to move on and uh, fill in some other portions now, but what we wanted to do is get that yellow in there first, and it's a little bit of just moving paint around. Now let's work on this ghost pumpkin. Now I've got some green there, and I think that's left over from our M&M project that we did last week. It's very, I think it's mainly just sap green, so very, very watery, and there's some blue sitting here next to it, and I think that blue is probably uh, the sea blue. If you don't have this particular set, it would be sap green and a phthalo blue. Just a very, very watery mix, and you can see I'm just painting right along these lobe lines. I'm not quite going to the center, but I'm painting right along the lobe lines, and now I've just got a wet brush, and it's pretty wet, and I'm just going to fill in the entire surface of the pumpkin except for the stem. And now I'm going to use some lifting off technique. And what that is, is when you take your brush, it's clean, and you wipe it off on a paper towel and then uh, put a stroke across wherever you want to lift the color off fairly firmly. And then that will, that will lighten the color there a little bit. Now the next pumpkin I'm going to do is the one right below that ghost pumpkin. It's kind of greenish. It's a little bit of variegation to it. 
And the colors that I'm mixing are uh, that emerald green, the one right next to the yellow ochre. And then I'm going to go in and mix some of the burnt sienna with that just to tone it down, but to keep it, it's not going to change its value in such a way um, like we will with the one on the bottom right where we just add black. This one is going to just intensify that green and really warm it up. So this is going to give us a really lovely green to put in the clefts. And we're going to kind of do the same thing that we did with our, our yellow stripes up there. So you'll notice I'm just painting along the cleft and then a little bit in the curve. I'm not going all the way around the lobe. I'm just kind of uh, making that little shape there, kind of a Y uh, where it comes out. And I am going all the way to the stem on this one. So now I've got a wet brush, just clean water on it, and I'm going to fill each lobe with water. Now you can leave the center blank um, or you can do like I did and uh, lift some of the water off the center. So just as we go along here, you can see that most of the color will kind of lie on the outer edges towards the lobes. And then you can make adjustments as you go on. If it's not quite what you want, you can blot it off and redo it. Um, if you get to the point though where you're doing a lot of blotting off, maybe you want to just let that area sit for a minute because you don't want to overwork your paper and uh, damage it in any way. So I'm just kind of trying to coax this darker green that I've got and make it come into the center a little bit, not entirely, but just a little bit. And I am going ahead and putting that water all the way to the edge so that that color can continue to migrate and really form a, a final edge to the pumpkin. And with that same green now, I'm tapping it around the stem of this pumpkin on the upper right. And I'm just kind of making little flicks and dots all around the stem of the pumpkin and um, putting it on here fairly, fairly thick. There's kind of a lot of pigment there and it's pretty loose. It's not very viscous at all. And now I'm going in with clean water and filling in each of the lobes. And you can see I'm catching that green pigment that I just put around the stem so that it will flow into that water that I've laid down. So I'm going to go around the entire pumpkin like this and just continue to coax that green that I put down and look at the on the bottom there. Look at the one on the bottom and see how that pigment is just migrating down. Now you can be kind of uh, sparse with this water that you put in. You don't have to have um, every single area of it covered. And what that will do is it'll create some natural areas of white. So however you, wherever you think of it, if you put water there, the watercolor, the pigment is going to find a way to get there. Um, we can control that a little bit with drying it or with blotting things up, but I'm just kind of playing around here and just kind of coaxing this green wherever I think it would look kind of natural. So I'm just kind of continuing to flick around and load this pumpkin up with uh, some very light versions of color. And now I'm going to go into the lightest green that we have here and they call that one a yellow green. And I'm just kind of mixing it in with that same green well that we had before. And I'm going to also mix in some of that yellow. And I'm, I think I used the same cadmium yellow deep. I don't think I used the Indian yellow on this one. And I'm going to wet the lobes on this pumpkin over here because now I want to kind of catch this one up to the one in the upper left. And I just want to add water in because what I'm going to do is I want to keep this area moving. I want to keep the paint moving and I'm going to go in with that lighter green and kind of do the same thing that I did with the pumpkin up there on the upper left. But this time I'm using that, that uh, light green mixed with the yellow to just kind of fill in these spots. So you can see I'm putting a stripe on each side. I'm leaving the center kind of blank, but I'm putting a stripe on each side and just really letting it go wherever it wants to go. I'm not controlling this. I'm just letting the paint have a good old time. This is its little party on the pumpkin and I'm letting it happen. And if it ever looks like in an area where your darker green is not quite dark enough, add some more. There's always a shift in watercolor. There's always a color shift. And a lot of times when we're painting, we'll see, we'll get something done and then we'll realize another area of our painting is just not quite dark enough. It's not quite intense enough. Go back in and put another glaze over it or another wash and uh, you can catch it up to the rest of your painting and uh, be happy with it. So let's see where we're headed now. I think what I want to do is put another layer of uh, clear water on this ghost pumpkin up here. Now we're not covering the stem again because you see as soon as we got that green pumpkin painted, the ghost pumpkin really started to disappear. So now I've got to mix in uh, some more intense shadows for this particular one. 
And I think the green that I'm, or excuse me, the blue I'm going to use here for this is that French ultramarine. And I'm just going to mix in a touch of the burnt sienna because I don't want it to be bright blue. I want it to be kind of a dark, uh, like a denim color blue. And if you don't have these two colors, you could use an indigo or a Payne's gray. Just make sure it's a very thin wash. And now it kind of looks like one of those uh, 1960s flowers, but we're using that, that lift off technique again uh, to go ahead and uh, soften those edges. And now we're going to fill in a little bit more along the, the edges uh, coming out of from the stem just to kind of try and create some texture. Just play with it. Go with what you feel. Go with whatever you think looks right. And the, the key to making these pumpkins work is not having your circles perfect. If they're all very, very perfect, they will tend to look fake and they'll kind of stop looking like pumpkins. So you want to have them kind of off just a little bit. And for those of you who might be a little bit intimidated by drawing, you know what? This is a really great one to do because you don't want it perfect. You don't want your circles to look absolutely circular. <laughs> so this is one that you can really let go and just have fun with. Let's mix up some more of that emerald green. And I'm going to knock it back again here in just a minute with more of the burnt sienna because I don't like um, how green this is going in with that. So I wanted to, uh, to just mix a little bit more in that same puddle and still going... Uh, wet into wet here. I think by this time it's probably wet into damp and just kind of pulling that pigment around, really defining those lobes, trying to make them look a little bit deeper. Um, another way that you could do this is you could do a very fine line of uh, an even darker shade in the center of that cleft and that would do it for you. Okay, on to the next pumpkin. Now for this particular one, let's mix some of that cadmium red light with a little bit of the scarlet. We're going to really make this orange a deep red orange. And if you have that color, then you can certainly use that. But I like mixing this one a little bit because what we want to do is we want to have one side of it a little bit more red than the other side. Now this one is just going to be a little bit interesting. So just kind of watch what I'm doing here. I've started over on the left and I've just kind of squooshing my brush. That's a term, by the way, squooshing. <laughs> I'm kind of making a jagged line around the border of this. And what I'm going to do, you kind of have to work quickly to do this because you don't want to have a, a ring around what you're painting. Um, but I want to be able to fill this in pretty quickly. I'm leaving some of the white space because frankly, at this point, I hadn't decided what I was going to do with those scars yet. Um, but what I want to do now is while it's wet, I'm just going to drop in some of that scarlet on the darker side and I'm pulling it toward the center. So I'm going back into the scarlet here and just pulling it toward the center on the top portion of it where it's a little bit darker. And then I will put it toward the border on the bottom just a little bit, but I'm not going to pull it in all the way. So now let's see, I'm going to mix some of that scarlet with the burnt sienna because I think that's going to be really neat to, uh, to bring in some of these uh, ridges in this particular pumpkin. So you can see it's over there on the left and now I'm just pulling this in from the border, just kind of using my brush from the inner side to from the center out to the edge or from the edge into the center and just kind of putting some marks down, trying to get these little ridges of the pumpkin. This pumpkin in particular looks very different from all the rest. It doesn't have those lobes and clefts and it's just kind of uh, got these narrow ridges all over. So I think that's good. We'll leave that one like that for now. Let's go into this uh, Indian yellow here and we'll get a good bit of that. And I'm just going to go over on the side of this same pile. You can use pile, puddle, whatever you want to call it. You can use your palette wells to your advantage because um, oftentimes there's plenty of space there. And um, if you've only used a little bit of a space, then if you've got something in the same color family, for instance, um, reds, oranges, and yellows, or uh, blues and greens, that kind of thing, if you want to mix those things together in the same palette, you sure can. So don't forget to leave that space for the stem on this one, because this one has the stem that's going um, up and off to the right a little bit there. And I'm just using kind of a mix of what I've got in this palette. And you can see, I really like the way that worked. And so I'm just mixing that Indian yellow in with that reddish orange that's there. And I'm using that to kind of define the lobes on this particular pumpkin. And it doesn't really matter if you do all the lobes first and then fill it in. What I want to do is I want it to mix naturally, just like we did the ones on top where we pulled in the clear water to let the pigment play with its, play with its friends next door um, <laughs> to let those edges get softened. What I want to do here on this one on the bottom is to put the red there so that the orange can naturally mix with that. 
And now we're going to have a lot of fun. Let's go ahead and go back into that emerald green and we're just going to bring it down in value with that coal black. There's a lot that we can do here. I'm just kind of testing to see how, um, how dark I've got it. And I think I need it just a little bit darker. This pumpkin, this black one here is so dark that I really thought it looked very dark green. Um, and now you can see I've got about three lobes done and I'm going in with just clean water and pulling that pigment around. This one, I'm, we're going to end up making a little bit of changes on as we go because I didn't like the way that it looked when it's full, uh, fully painted just like this. So go ahead and fill it in and then you'll be able to see how we're going to change that without putting on more pigment right just yet. We're going to end up taking some of the pigment off because when you're dealing with something so dark like this, if you continue to add a, a layer to it, a glaze or a wash, if you do that on top of, of a pigment that's very dark to begin with, your painting can really start to look overworked. So I'm going to show you here how to work with these dark colors without having your, pa your painting really look too overworked. I've added some more black and I'm going to go in and define the, um, the clefts in this pumpkin. Now this is, I'm not using just black. I have mixed it in with the green. So I've got all of those in there and I'm going to go around the edges of it as well. And this is wet into damp. The paper is damp with watercolor and I'm putting wet pigment on top of it. And now I'm going to go in with a brush that is wet and I've blotted it off and I'm just lifting some of this off. And this is where we want to have fun with our lifting off. And this will really give some great texture to this pumpkin. See that? You take your brush, you get it wet, and you scrub a little bit, and then you're going to blot it off with a paper towel. And this will create a really natural edge, a really wonderful texture. And I'm doing this on every lobe where it would be the highest, or as we're looking at it, it would be the, the part of the pumpkin that's absolutely closest to us with the exception of the stem. So that really gives that a nice, soft, natural look. And now we'll go back in to our clean water here, and we're just going to paint this pumpkin up here on the top left again, and um, just kind of filling everything in with water. You don't have to be real exact with this. Um, you know, just kind of get some water on the edges and toward those uh, the clefts a little bit. We'll go around that edge with some more of the sap green and just kind of lightly pulling it in along the, the centers or the, the clefts. The clefts on this one I think are yellow, sorry. Um, and now we'll go in with that uh, cadmium yellow and pull that in as well. So the entire pumpkin is kind of wet and then we're just placing this paint on. And because we didn't really wet it evenly, that's a really good thing because now that paint can mingle with its neighbors or stay put. And that is how you achieve getting that really neat texture in there without having to draw every little curve and detail that's there. So just let it, let it rest, let it do its thing. It may not look like what you want to now, especially if you drop your paintbrush in it. If that happens, just um, blot it up and then we'll go ahead and we'll uh, put some paint on there, agitate it a little bit and then lift it off. So no harm done, very easy to fix. We'll just plop some yellow back in there and then we'll be good to go. And that will be our little secret. <laughs> so now let's go ahead and we're gonna go into that ultramarine again. And this time I'm gonna kind of make it a little bit purple, just slightly. I've got some red there and I just wanna mix that just a little bit with the red. And I'm gonna go in around this ghost pumpkin again and build up these shadows. Now right there, I think I do end up touching the, um, the ghost pumpkin to the green one, and I really like that effect. You can be very careful and keep them apart, or you can intentionally run your colors together because this is really kind of a fun, loose painting, and it's really fun to play with their watercolor effects that way. Going in over that with clear water, and let's mix up a little bit more of the purple and just kind of drop that in little bits here and there along the clefts and we don't want this to be too too purple just slightly slightly red it's like a blue that's slightly red just building up shadows good shadow colors can be Payne's gray they can be purple they can be blue however you are working with your paint whatever color you think would be a really good shadow and a lot of times it's the color that's opposite on the spectrum so here we've got a pumpkin next to us that's yellow Purple is going to make a really nice shadow there because that's going to give our eye something interesting to look at. 
now let's go in and kind of clean up these edges a little. We'll just put a little bit more of this, uh, that dark pigment on there. And I went ahead and used the dark green that we've mixed with the coal black. That's okay. We can just uh, go ahead and continue to use that. Uh, let's go ahead and mix some green in with the yellow though for these parts because I don't want the entire thing to be too black. But around the edge, that would be fine because that's going to be a place where a shadow would normally happen anyway. And now we'll mix some more of that yellow green with that cadmium yellow or the Indian yellow. And we're just kind of placing it in the center. You can see there just kind of plopping it down. And now we'll come in with the water and work those two together. So this particular painting is all about letting your paints move and play on the paper. As soon as you put the water down, you can really experiment. Do I want to put the water down very smoothly, very evenly, or do I want to try kind of a big drop of water and see what happens. A pumpkin is a really good way to do that because all of these gourds have different texture on their skin and they all look just a little bit different. So playing with your water, the amount of water that you're putting down is really a fun thing to do with this particular painting. Just defining those clefts in there a little bit more and let's see which one should we do next. Go, let's go back into this burnt sienna here and I think we're going to work on that uh, reddish orange pumpkin. I'm going to continue with these stripes and I'm just spacing them about a quarter of an inch, you know, and going kind of uh, all over evenly except here on the bottom where I'm using a little bit of uh, sideways brush stroke. And now we'll pull these in again, uh, just going from the outside into the center. And now, because I don't want it to look striped like a baseball, I'm going to go in with that scarlet once again. Oh, excuse me, that was the cadmium red light, and we're mixing in a little bit of the scarlet. And now we're going to wash over those stripes just a little. I'm just using another pigment to kind of soften those lines and pull them in. And you can really see that here on the bottom, how that works. I'm just kind of trying to play with this a little bit just to make sure that we don't end up with a striped pumpkin. So by going in and moving those stripes around. Now you don't want to agitate it a whole lot because I'm painting in the same direction of the stripes. I just want to let that burnt sienna that I put down, I want to give it the opportunity to move. And now I've gone in on top of that and I've dropped some clean water. So let's just let that one sit and play and let's see what it wants to do. And meanwhile, I think we can go and take a look at that pumpkin on the lower left. Let's mix some more of the Indian yellow in there and uh, we'll go ahead and put another wash on there. Now you can see how I'm doing kind of a C stroke, starting at one lobe and then going uh, along the bottom or over to the other lobe. Because the shadows on this one, I really want them to be the same color as the pumpkin. And there you go. It's that simple. And now we'll go in with the clear water again and let those lines soften. Whenever you put pigment down, if you come back in with clean water, you can really let it soften. And then of course, blotting off or lifting off will give you some really fun natural texture and nice soft highlights. And now there's our emerald green and coal black mix again. And let's go ahead and pump this one up a little bit because it's the only one left that looks like it still needs another little bit of something. So we're going to go ahead and get it wet everywhere. And I'm using quite a bit of water here. I'm really being free with the water. And you know, for this whole with this whole painting, I've just used a number four round so far. You can use different brushes. You can do whatever you want. But for this one, I thought a number four round would really work well. And it did. I didn't feel like I needed to change my, my brush size at all. So we're going to go ahead and fill in those clefts again. And again, it's, this is all wet on wet. We've got that pumpkin completely wet and now we're adding some more pigment along the edges and in those clefts to kind of define the shadows a little bit more. And you can see as this has time to work and play on its on the paper there, the edges are getting softer, the shadows are getting a little more hazy, but it's really giving the pumpkin some really neat dimension and that's what we're trying to achieve. So it's starting to look a little bit weird though because we don't have the stems done. Now we will get to that here, but I think what we want to do first is give this a little dry. Now I am using a heat tool. You don't have to do that. You could get up and walk away from your painting. Just make sure when you come back that it is completely dry because we kind of want these stems to be a little bit defined. We don't want them to run into the body of the pumpkin. 
I'm just kind of putting a little dot of yellow ochre on each of these tops of the stems, the part where they would have been cut from the vine. That one, I'm gonna go all the way around the whole thing, but like this one here and this guy down here, I'm just gonna do the little top part. And then let's see, we'll pull that down just a little bit into the stem. I'm just kind of looking at the, the picture as I'm painting and I'm kind of trying to see which colors are underlying the color of the stem. Yellow ochre is a really great color to have on your palette because it's such a ruddy, natural yellow. You can use it for gold uh, or you can use it to paint fall leaves. It, it often occurs in landscapes and in things that are found in nature, animal fur, lots of things, and in our pumpkin stems. Now it's time for us to go in and define some little bit of texture in those pumpkin stems. So you can see we're starting off with some brown and I've got a pretty viscous mix of that. It's as I go on, it'll almost be the texture of yogurt. We'll dry the painting once again because now we want to put in a little bit of detail. And what you're doing is you're just trying to put in the shadows and the ridges on the pumpkin stem. Just look at your uh, reference photo and wherever you see those ridges, you can kind of suggest those by painting them around, much like I'm doing here. You know, if you're really enjoying yourself, and I hope you are, I just wanted to uh, take a moment here while you're watching the, the stems take shape and mention that if you really like things like this where you have a full-time tutorial and you want to paint more than something just once a week, well, I've got memberships available here that are just like on Patreon, but they're available here on YouTube. So what you'll get with your membership is a whole lot of things. There's a button up under the video. If you're looking at uh, a desktop, there's a button that says join and you can click on that and it will teach you all about the membership levels that I have to offer. So just like on Patreon, when you have more of a one-on-one -on -one relationship with, uh, with your, um, your instructor, that's what you will have with me with a membership here on Art on the Creek. You will be able to make special requests, what you want to paint. You will have videos that are for you as a member, but not for the general public. And those are lessons that can be any level, any, uh, any medium, anything that you want to request. And I will also provide things if you can't think of anything. Um, for the Pikes Peak level, you will have a, a lesson once a week. And for the Red Rocks level, you'll have a lesson once a month that is for you as a member. All members will also have access to a review before the public gets that, and that will occur once a month. In addition to that, there are often times that I review art supplies here, and then for whatever reason or another, either I don't have room or it's just not something that I will use, I have a lot of art supplies that are just sitting around here collecting dust. So what I really like to do for all of my members in the United States is to be able to give you the opportunity to get some of those art supplies for free. Most of them have only been used once and I would like to be able to share the wealth <laughs> with all of you. Um, and I'm going to be starting to do that with my members as it gets closer to the holiday season so that you can have a little treat for yourself. One of the other really great things about being a member with Art on the Creek here on YouTube is that you and I will have the opportunity to really chat a whole lot more. And that's all going to be directed by you. If you don't want to chat, of course you don't have to, but <laughs> what I will be able to do is to give you critique on your paintings. And if that's something that uh, you would really like, I am more than happy to help you with that because I firmly believe that as an instructor, that's one way that I can really help you grow as an artist. I will respect whatever goals you have and I will help you to achieve them. So all of these things put together are really what makes Art on the Creek fun and a great place to be. And uh, regardless of where you are in that, uh, in that arena, if you just want to subscribe or if you just happen to stumble upon this video and you really like it, that's wonderful. Go ahead and give it a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed already, please do. Or you can share this video with your friends and have a painting party. That would be an awful lot of fun and all of these things really do help my channel. So thank you so much for letting me, uh, letting me interrupt my painting there and our little lesson and then let's get back to what we're doing. We're still working on those stems. Now let's go ahead and uh, get that really viscous mix, that really yogurt-like mix of the, of the dark brown. And for that, I think I've added some of that uh, burned brown into the burnt sienna. Some, uh, Van Dyke Brown, sorry, I couldn't think of the name. Van Dyke Brown or uh, Burnt Umber, either of those will work. 
You could even use a Payne's gray for this part. I'm just kind of defining the shadows in these stems a little bit, and I know that it's getting really, really dark right now, but what we're going to do is clean it up here. Let's get it dry first. And after that's had time to dry, we'll go ahead and get our brush wet, blot it off, and we're going to lift out some highlights again. You can see I've done at the very top of the stem, and now I'm kind of doing along the length of the stem and the base. And this is a really fun way to create some highlights. We'll go back in and redefine some of those lines that we lost. But this way, this can make the stem look a lot more um, realistic. So now let's take a look at another one here. We'll look at this green pumpkin down here at the bottom and we'll just do the same thing. We're just using a wet brush to gently lift off some of that pigment, blot it away, and then we'll lift off from the top. And what's so neat about that is that when you lift off gently, you can really just lift off one layer at a time. So that yellow ochre that we put down initially will still show through. And then at the base of the pumpkin, let's just add a little bit of that yellow green and we'll get this dry as well. Now, I really like the way our pumpkins came out. I think they really look wonderful, but what I wanna do is erase our guidelines. So I'm using my kneaded eraser here and I'm just kind of going around in that white space and picking up those extra lines. You can leave the background white. You don't have to do this next step at all, but I really thought a Payne's gray would be lovely and warm to put in there. So that's what we're gonna use. We're gonna go into the Payne's gray here and fill in all of that white space as a background. Now when you're erasing, I just wanna mention really quick that if you've already watercolored over your pencil lines, you won't be able to pick them up. It would be very unusual if you could. Um, so just remember that, that when you are using your pencil lines, and since watercolor is a transparent medium, um, you know, if your pencil lines are darker, like I said in the beginning, they will show through. So still using the number four brush here and mixing just enough paint for this one section, we're gonna go ahead and paint in this Payne's Gray. And we wanna keep it fairly thin because we don't want it to be so dark that it looks uh, chalky or unnatural. We want to be able to put the pigment chiefly in one section and then pull it out from there. So don't get in the habit of outlining an area um, Let's see how we do on this next one here. Now this little triangle is just gonna, we're just gonna fill that in, but you can see how I put the pigment around the edge of the pumpkin and then pulled it out away from there. So let me mix some more and I'm trying to keep it the same consistency because that way that will uh, allow me to have the same color value. So we're gonna go around this edge here and continue to go up from that corner and just fill in the space that way. We're gonna try not to outline and then fill into the center because that's gonna give each of these Payne's Gray sections a little bit of a harsh look to them. But if you start in one corner of it, of that little shape there, that white shape, and then pull it out, it will look a little bit better. It'll give it a little bit more texture. And I very gently drug the brush in between the pumpkins there. You wanna be very careful there and go very lightly or use a smaller brush here. You can see the delicate touch here to separate those two pumpkins. Um, that part also is not necessary, but I thought that, uh, that it kind of needed it. And now I'm gonna do the same over here in this little white section. I'm just got the, I start by putting a border on one of the pumpkins and then I pull the pigment out from there. And I just kind of try and keep my brush strokes pretty much in the same direction and I try and keep that consistency of the paint even through all of these. Now I see that there's that orange blob that kind of migrated into that green pumpkin and I don't want that there. So I've got the brush wet and I just scrubbed it a little bit and blotted it off. And now I can go into that Payne's Gray here, mix some more, and now I'll fill in from that section. So you see I've outlined the one pumpkin there and now I'm pulling it down from the corner just filling in that little triangular shape and just kind of trying to pull that pigment around very evenly. Now, this might seem a little bit painstaking, but trust me on this one, this is worth the effort because if we were just to go in willy-nilly <laughs> and just kind of put different, different uh, consistencies of Payne's Gray in each of these little sections and maybe do our brush strokes in a random sort of way, you would be able to see it when it dries. So what I'm trying to do is to be very careful and fill in these sections in such a way that they're really gonna blend because this particular background is really just a bunch of negative space. The, the pieces of the background, the elements of the background really aren't touching each other. 
So we need to be very careful to provide a continuity where we don't really have one uh, because these might be sitting on uh, you know, a, a tablecloth or a slate and we need to kind of have that look very intentional. So that's why we're taking the time to very slowly fill these in. I'm still using that number four round brush and I'm just trying to pull the pigment out from the corners into the larger space. This will also concentrate the pigment on the parts where you would naturally have a shadow. So we don't have to worry about adding shadows in because we can all just, we can kind of just naturally put them in uh, by filling in all of these spaces in this manner. So we're just continuing around here, touching that one up a little bit. I didn't think that was dark enough. And here's a very tiny one right here. You might have some different spaces than I do because you may have drawn your pigments, excuse me, you may have drawn your pumpkins a little bit different than I did. Um, so just know that uh, whatever you have for white space. That's where we're doing this. And you can use Payne's Gray. What would be another good color to use would be Indigo. Um, burnt Sienna would be a nice color to use. Um, actually, I'm going to take that back up. Maybe a Burnt Umber, something that's not quite as red. Uh, purple would be kind of fun. Anything that's really going to either uh, be a contrast to this or kind of uh, an accompaniment, a really nice accompaniment. And I thought that this Payne's Gray, being the dark navy uh, that it is, it's kind of really more blue than it is gray in this particular set that that would really uh, work out quite well. If you have a neutral tint, this would be a fun time to use that one. Um, or Moon Glow, if you have some of that Daniel Smith Moon Glow or uh, Da Vinci Artemis, those would look really nice in this as well. So just filling in this tiny corner here, this little last section, and we are done. Let's take a look at it and see if we like everything. And let's see here, I think, I think, that this is a winner. Let's dry it off and we'll take one more look. Well, those of you who have painted with me or watched any of my videos probably know that as soon as I dry something or sign it, I find something else that needs to be done. So uh, the tweak monster <laughs> is in full force here today, but this is actually something that I really did want to fix. This is where that orange kind of leapt into that, uh, the lighter colored pumpkin there on top. And I need to rebuild that layer a little bit. So we'll do that one. And then I'm just kind of going to go around this pumpkin here and uh, do the same sort of thing. Just get it wet, put a little bit more pigment down just to keep it even looking. Uh, all of the lobes look like they're the same color value. So it doesn't look like one is really overdone. And I really like the way that that has turned out. And now I think now I think finally, finally, we are finished. Let's get this dry. Whenever you have a really dark painting like this, there's several things you can use to sign it. I've chosen a white gel pen, um, which I do have recommended in the supplies down in the description below. You could also use a white pastel pencil or um, a white colored pencil might work. If you have one that's really opaque, like a Prismacolor, that would work just fine. So there you go, guys. Here is your painting of pumpkins. I hope you really enjoy it. The one thing that I didn't show you here at the end of the video is how to remove that paper from the block. There is a little space up under there on the top that you can uh, put a splitting device in, either a palette knife or a plastic picnic knife, anything like that, and then just run it around the edge to get that adhesive off and you'll be able to free your painting from the block. Here's our work for today. I hope you guys really enjoyed this lesson number 11, and I hope you're having a wonderful creative Saturday. We will see you next time. Take care, everybody. Bye now.